going to examine quite a few uh, passages of Scripture tonight. As we begin, let's uh, pray. Heavenly Father, we just want to pause for a moment and thank you for the joy we have of gathering in this beautiful place in the middle of the week. Uh, everything begins to sag a little bit. A lot of people call it Wednesday hump day. But uh, it, it's good to get to the middle of the week and come in here on a Wednesday evening and, and experience a lift. Uh, your word always lifts us up. And we pray that uh, you would lift us by your Holy Spirit tonight and uh, excite us about the things that we know are reality. And I pray that uh, you would open the word to us and open us to the word. We pray that you'd give us tender hearts. We ask that you'd make us teachable. And we pray that you'd help us just to be like a sponge soaking up your word. I pray that every one of us who is together now listening to me, I pray that all of us will sincerely desire the milk of the word, that we might thereby grow up into salvation. And to that end, we will apply ourselves and we'll give you all the praise and thank you in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. All right. We uh, are looking at uh, the book of Hebrews, which is an absolutely magnificent book and one that uh, we delight to study in because it is, uh, you'll notice as we go through uh, Hebrews, it's a uh, it's a, a book about the greatness of God. It's all about greatness. It's all about the greater things. A lot of great things in the world, but we're looking at the great things. The greatness of God, and this is how it begins in chapter 1. Uh, the greatness of God is seen in the fact that he has always spoken to his people. Uh, God has ways of communicating with us. There is no way that we can find God and be able to communicate with him. He had to come to us. And this is the way he designed it. No man can find him. He is the one who finds us. And that's why he sent Jesus Christ, is it not? To seek and to save those who are lost. And so he has his unique ways, and uh, Paul says in various and different ways, he uh, has spoken to us in the past. He's spoken to us by the prophets, and then he's spoken to us by his son, Jesus Christ. So, we also look at the greatness of Jesus Christ. That's what we did last week. Because uh, uh, in chapters 1 and 2, we find the subject of the angels. And the angels have already played, always played a major role uh, in God's economy. But we need to understand that Jesus is greater than angels. And angels have awesome power. They have authority. But Jesus is greater than angels. So we would never worship angels. Remember that John had an angel that showed him all of these marvelous things that we've already looked at in the book of Revelation. And uh, uh, John, when the angel appeared to him, John fell down on his knees to worship him. The angel said, no, 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 no. No, get up on your feet. Don't worship me. And we know the rest, right? Worship God. So, Jesus is greater than the angels. And what we're going to embark on tonight, and we're going to look at a number of greater things through the book of but for the next couple of weeks, I think, we'll be dealing with the greatest, the greatness of our salvation. We have a salvation that is greater than, than we would ever have known without the revelation of Scripture. Now, it's easy for us to know we're born again. We uh, know that we have confessed our faith in Jesus Christ, that we truly believe in Jesus Christ. And Jesus said, he that believeth, in the Son has everlasting life. So we are God's people. We are in Christ's family. He is our Redeemer. So we're looking now at the greatness of salvation, which is the, the, the whole scope of salvation. And this, as we're looking at on Sunday morning, because these two uh, overlap. By the way, you can teach without preaching. But you can't teach, you can't preach without teaching. Preaching is teaching. So what's the difference in Sunday morning and Sunday night? And I know a lot of times what I do on Wednesday evening feels, did I say Sunday night? Wednesday night. Uh, a lot of times on Wednesday night, it does sound like a sermon, and sometimes I'm guilty of sermonizing on, on a Wednesday. But the difference in Sunday morning and Sunday night, the difference in the sermon and the Bible study is that the, the, the sermon uh, deals with particulars that, uh, that convey 
a certain point that teaches a certain and particular thing. In Bible study, we're what we call exegeting the scriptures. We're looking at the scriptures and sort of examining every word and pulling them apart and going back and forth because the Bible is its own best commentary. And uh, this is the way we learn. It's, it's, uh, it's in-depth Bible study. That's the difference. So that's what you're going you're gonna to see here tonight. Uh, we're going to begin with the greatness of salvation. Salvation is much greater than we have imagined. We know about our redemption. We know about our being born again. We know that we have come to faith and that the Lord has given us this great faith. But it, it, it doesn't stop there. It, this is to affect every single area of living. So we're going to begin in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 1. Now, we, we gave an overview of this, particularly looking at the angels in comparison to Jesus last week. But we're just going to begin a kind of verse by verse in chapter 2 and look at it in, in, in detail. Uh, verse 1. Therefore, and that's because of everything has, that has been said, if you look back to verse uh, to the last, uh, if you look back to the last verse in uh, chapter one, he talks about uh, the angels, and he said, are, "Are those angels not ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation?" This is how important this whole subject is of the scope of our salvation. So in chapter 2, he says, therefore, because this is true, because God has invested so much in communicating with us through his word and through the prophets and through Jesus Christ and ministering to us through angels, therefore, he says, therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. We must give much closer attention to what we have heard. Well, let's think about this for a moment. What is it that we have heard? We're going to itemize a few things. Number one, we have heard that we are chosen by God. Now, keep your finger here, and let's turn back to Ephesians chapter 1, which is one of our most profound doctrinal letters from the Apostle Paul. Pure God. So this is the word of God. Ephesians chapter 1. Look at verses 3 and 4. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Nothing has been left out. Peter deals with this in his second letter, chapter 1. That everything that pertains to life and godliness has been given to us. Verse 4. Even as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. We are chosen by God. Now this is a left, folks. This is very inspirational. Most people feel like they're not worthy. They feel like uh, other people are better than they are. We fight against that. But every person needs to understand, every believer must understand that you have been chosen by God. He looked out across all of humanity, and for whatever reasons, and these reasons are only known to him, he chose you. You are his choice. Some of you may remember when you were in grade school. I don't know if they play this game anymore, but... Uh, when I was in school, we used to play Red Rover. Anybody remember that? Red Rover, Red Rover. Send Jimmy right over. And many of us know what it was like never to have your name called, to act as though you're not there. Uh, we, played, we played several games like that. As a matter of fact, they don't go to school anymore because they just determined it's not a good thing for other boys and girls to feel left out. I remember when uh, we would play a particular game and choose sides. And then you would have two or three people that were chosen last. They were the last ones to be chosen. And then somebody would say if there was one left, oh, we'll 
Thank Bobby. Come on, Bobby. And so he got in. That's, that's humiliating him. You don't have to worry about that. We have all been chosen by God from the foundation of the world. All of this is true, even as he has chosen us, and that even before the foundation of the world. So we are chosen by God. Secondly, we know that we are predestined. Look at Ephesians chapter 1, verse 6. He predestined us. God, the Father, predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will. He has chosen us and predestined us to adoption as sons. This is not our new birth. Over and over again, you've heard through your life, if you've been in church very long, that we've been adopted into the family of God. Not so. God has no stepchildren. We are birthed into the family of God. We are born again not adopted into the family. Adoption is the legal aspect of a rightful heir. The legal aspect. And that's what, what it is today when we adopt a child. If you have two children and you adopt a third and, and you adopt another, the third child has this legally, if, if it's a legal adoption, that third child has the same rights and privileges as the first two who are naturally born. So it is simply a legal process. This means that everything God does is just and right. So because we are born into God's family and we are his children, we have the adoption. We have the legal right to his everything he owns. We have the legal right to his property. We have the legal right to our inheritance. To adoption as sons. Galatians chapter 4 makes this very clear. He clarifies this, adoption as sons, because if you're adopted, you don't get the adoption. If the parent dies, you don't have the adoption until you're, well, let's say 21 years of age and you're turned uh, an adult. And so it is with God. The children, according to Galatians 4, the children don't get the adoption when they're small children. They don't get the inheritance. They have to wait until they reach maturity to get the uh, inheritance. Now, this is, you find this in Romans chapter 8, that uh, we, are, we, we are adopted into the family of God. We have legal right to the inheritance, but we're waiting on the inheritance. We're waiting on the judgment. And that is to determine if we are going to get all of our share with all the other family of God, or a portion of it, depending on how we have lived. So, this leads us to the, to the fourth thing that we know about ourselves. We have an inheritance. Adoption is of no value at all if there is no inheritance. So, we have an inheritance. Once again, look at Ephesians chapter 1, verses 11 and 12. In Christ, we have obtained an inheritance having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his own will. Very clearly it says we have an inheritance. And what is our inheritance? Jesus gave that to us in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5. And he said, the meek shall inherit the earth. You also find it in the Old Testament. One instance of that is in Psalm 37. Uh, the meek shall inherit the earth. We are going to inherit real estate. We're going to get a part of the family farm. And what is the family farm? It's the earth. God owns it all. And so he has bequeathed this earth to us. So we have an inheritance. Having been predestined, and let's look at that word for a minute. Predestined. Our destiny, that means where we're headed, has been marked out for us ahead of time, before the foundation of the world. We are predestined to receive the inheritance. We are predestined as rightful heirs. And this has nothing to do with our new birth. Our new birth is our election. And that's the word ecclesia, the word in which we get church. So every time you say the word church, 
you just said the word elect because ecclesia translated elect the meaning of that is the assembling of the saints so we are an assembly of the saints we are the church ecclesia now that's our being born again we were birthed into the family of god but since we are birthed into the family of god now we deal with the adoption and that has to do with our predestination. We are predestined to rule and reign with Christ. That is our destiny. On this earth, we are predestined to rule and reign with Jesus Christ. So we don't ever want to get the two confused. But notice the last part of uh, verse 12. He says, all of this is according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. The word there for works is ergon. It means to exert energy. And it means that the Lord works everything. And you love Romans 8, 28, as we all do. And that is, uh, uh, for God works all things out according to the counsel of his will. Every single thing. And let's look at a few other verses. Look back at uh, Psalm, and you don't have to turn to these. I'm just going to give you a couple of examples here, jot some things down. You might want to note Psalm 135, verse 6. Whatever the Lord pleases, he does in heaven and on earth, in the seas and in all the deeps. Now, why does he say in the seas and all the deeps? That's simply an allusion to, uh, uh, to the things that we can't see or understand. The sea is a whole different way of life. We have to breathe air. We cannot breathe underwater. All the living creatures in the sea have to breathe through the water. They cannot breathe when they're taken out of the water. It's, it's a totally different environment from anything that we're familiar with. We don't understand. And in the deep places of the sea are things that, that they are even now discovering. There's, there, there are life forms in the depth of the sea that they're constantly discovering that were not known before. So it, it's, just, it, it's just telling us that God does whatever he pleases, wherever it is, whether you see it and understand it or whether you don't. God does whatsoever he pleases. As a matter of fact, that's what makes him God. And I can tell you right now that if you were God, you're not, of course, but if you were, you would do whatever you please to do, whenever you please to do it. We're fallen creatures, and we have this God complex. And you look around you and you see people today who just will not be told what to do. Uh, Daniel and a lot of these people in law enforcement have to deal with this almost on a daily basis. When they stop some younger person and say, get out of the car, because I'm not getting out. Let me see your driver's license. I don't have to do that. It, it's hard to deal with people that they have the God company. You don't tell me what to do. I do whatever I want to do when I want to do it. If I want to get out of the car, I'll get out, but not until then. And you have to exert force. What is that? Oh, you can call it rebellion, you can call it ignorance, you can call it stubbornness, or anything you want to. It actually is a God complex. I don't have to do what anyone tells me to do. So, that's who God is. God is God, so he does, in heaven and earth, whatever he wants to do, whenever he wants to do it. And the reverse of that is true. The converse of that is true. He doesn't do what he doesn't want to do. And he doesn't allow what he, what, what he doesn't want to happen unless he has a purpose in it. And so look at Isaiah chapter 46, verse 10. I just cite it. He declares the end from the beginning. And from ancient times, things not yet done say my counsel shall stand, and I will accomplish all my purpose. God cannot be hindered. God cannot be challenged. God cannot be changed. God is perfect. And everything that is happening has been set in place from the foundation of the world. That is our God. And nothing will change because it was set in, 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 in motion according to what he purposed according to his plan. You look at anything in government today, anything that's going on, you look at 
the situation with uh, former President Donald Trump and, and President Joe Biden and all of these things that are going on in government today. And you, know, you have to understand that God put all of this in motion from the foundation of the world. It's just unfolding as it goes along. And we don't know what God's plan is. We don't know what he's going to do through this. We just know that all of this is a part of God's plan. Now, the alternative view you have is that some of this is not according to God's plan. Now, that puts you in a real dilemma there. If God is not, if something has happened that God has not put in the plan, who did it? Who would that be? And how do you know that he can't do something that is, that, that is contrary to God's purpose and plan and push through God's plan and push God aside and accomplish something that is out of God's control? It's, 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 it's not a dilemma. The Bible sells it in these kinds of passages. He says, my counsel shall stand and I will accomplish all my purpose. Listen to Genesis chapter 50. In verse 20, and this comes out of one of our favorite stories in the Old Testament, the story of Joseph and his brothers. And you remember how his brothers sold him to slavery. And then Joseph was a man of such outstanding character and faith in the Lord that the Lord delivered him and made him second in the land of Egypt only to Pharaoh. He was not only Pharaoh's right-hand man, he was the second in absolute control even to the point of Pharaoh's household. And this was Joseph. You remember how his brothers found him, finally. And he was discovered to them. And then uh, they reconciled some of that. And his father died. And after his father was buried, his brothers came to him and said, Daddy said for us to tell you that we were sorry and for you to forgive us. And I want you to listen to what Joseph said in verse 20 of chapter 50. He said to his brothers, these wicked brothers that sold him into slavery, he said, as for you, you meant it, you meant evil against me. But God meant it for good to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. He said to those brothers, you meant it for evil. He didn't excuse them. He said, you meant it for evil, but he said, God was working. None of us knew it, but God was working. He was working through that. God meant, listen to the word, but God meant. God had done this by design. He said, God meant it for good that many people would be kept alive as they are today. Let me remind you of one more, and that's in the book of Exodus, chapter 4. And you remember how Moses went up on the mountain and received the tablets. And while he was gone, almost 40 days, and this was just before he returned, this is what uh, the people said. Um, no, let's back up. Let's back up. Uh, just sort of scratch what I just said. We're back in chapter 4, verse 21, when the people were murmuring against Moses because he didn't have any water. And the Lord said to Moses, When you go back to Egypt, see that you do before Pharaoh all the miracles that I have put in your power. But I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. And you read on through that entire episode, you'll find out that 19 times the scripture tells us that God either said he would have hardened Pharaoh's heart or that he had hardened Pharaoh's heart. Only three times do you find that Pharaoh hardened his heart. And the only reason he hardened his heart is because God had already hardened his heart. Now, let's go back to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 12. All of this that we have learned is so, uh, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ, and that's the original apostles, might be to the praise of his glory. All of these things have happened. They said, including us, Paul said, that we might be to the praise of his glory. But look at verse 13. In him, you also, when you heard the word of truth, 
The gospel of your salvation. That's an interesting phrase. The gospel of your salvation. Remember that words are the only thing we have to communicate. God uses words to communicate to us. And so we have to look at every word. And we ask the question, why did the Holy Spirit word it this way? Since you heard the good news of your salvation. If anyone else other than the Holy Spirit had been penning this, it would have read something like, since you heard the good news that you could be saved. That's the way we look at it. That's the way we would say it. And some people have tried to make this sound like God is saying, uh, but since you heard the good news that you could be born again. But that's not what he says. He says, since you heard the good news, and the word good news is gospel, since you heard the gospel of your salvation. Well, the truth of the matter is that uh, all of our salvation comes down to hearing. And uh, once again, uh, let's change places. Let's go to Romans chapter 10, verses 8 through 10, some verses that you're very familiar with. But I just want to point out a few things that you'll find in this passage. In Romans chapter 10, verses 8 through 10, it might help you to turn there for a moment. What does the scripture say in Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 14? The word is now, the word is near you. In your mouth and in your heart. And the heart is the mind. Okay? Uh, when you find the word heart in the Bible, it's almost never referring to this muscle that pumps blood through your veins. It's the word cardia, and it actually is the front lobe of the mind. As a man thinks in his heart, so is it. How you think in your mind, and that's the only place you can think. Uh, so all right. He says, that word is near you. In your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Verse 10. For with the heart one believes and is justified. And with the mouth one confesses and is saved. Verse 14. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? Verse 17. So faith comes from hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ. You cannot be saved without hearing the word of God. And you can only preach the word if you are sent. People must hear the word of God. And that's what we're doing here tonight. That's the reason it's, it's advantageous to be here rather than to be at home just reading the Bible yourself. We need to hear the word. We need to hear it preached and taught. So back to Ephesians chapter 1. And let's just review what we learned tonight. Right? We learned that we are chosen, chosen by God. We are His choice. We are predestined to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. We are redeemed. We are born again. And I like this next one. I put it in our vernacular. We're in the family wheel. We're in the will. And then we're going to look at one more. Verse number five. We are sealed by the Holy Spirit. Verse 13, Ephesians 1. When we heard, when we hear, we heard the good news of our salvation. Here's what we heard. When the Lord put faith in your heart through the preaching of the word, what you heard is not that you could be saved, but that you were saved. Not that you could have a Savior, but you have a Savior. And remember that Jesus said from the cross, it is finished. So on the technical side, you were saved at the cross. 
You're not saved the day you maybe have written in your Bible. You were actually saved at the cross. But you did not know that until the Holy Spirit showed you Jesus. And that's when he gave you faith and all of a sudden you confess, I have a Savior. I have a Savior who died in my place. He died in my place because I am a sinner. That's the confession that you make. Not that you can have a Savior. Your confession is never, I've been told there's a Savior. And I need to think about it a little bit. I don't really know if I want a Savior or not. I don't really know if I want to be in the family of God or not. I need to sit down and think about this for a little bit. And come to my conclusion. Nobody gets saved that way. If you got saved as a child, you didn't get saved that way. If you got saved as an old and mature adult, you didn't get saved that way. You got saved by confessing that Jesus Christ is your Savior. That's what, when it became real to you. And that's your testimony today. Is I believe that Jesus Christ is my Savior. That he died in my place. That he is the only begotten Son of God. That I'm a sinner and there's no other way to be saved. He's in heaven, seated at the Father's right hand, and he's coming back for me. That's your confession of faith. That's the word that's near you, even in your mouth. So he says in verse uh, 13, When we heard and believed, we were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. Now what does that mean? We were sealed. <clears throat> some people think it means that as you put some substance, like through the summer you've been candy, and you put some substance in a jar, and you seal it really tight so nothing can get in and nothing can get out. They believe that that's sealing. That's not the word that's used here. That's not what this means. It doesn't mean that you're sealed up so nothing can get in and nothing can get out. It means that you are officially sealed. The president, every time he signs an executive order, it has the presidential seal on it. So when you look at it, it is sealed. That means it is official. That is his covenant. That is his act. And that's what it means to be sealed by the Holy Spirit. Uh, God has put his seal on us, his seal of approval on us, because we are in his family. Because he has put his spirit within us. That's his seal. So we are officially God's children. It's an official mark. We're sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. Verse 14. Who is the guarantee of our inheritance? Once again, confirming that we actually do have an inheritance. Until we acquire possession of it. We do not have it in our hands yet. We have not yet acquired possession of our inheritance. That will happen at the judgment seat of Christ in 2 Peter, 2 Corinthians chapter 2. 5 verse 10 when we all stand before the judgment seat of Christ we see what we've done whether in flesh or uh, whether it's good in flesh or bad so we're going to receive our inheritance there and that's what Peter has confirmed in 1 Peter chapter 1 verses 9 and 10 uh, which we've already looked at on Sunday morning where he says we're obtaining we're in the process we don't have it yet but we're obtaining the outcome of our faith our faith is designed to have an outcome. That's what it means to produce fruit. We are to produce fruit. It's to be the outcome of our faith. That it produces works of righteousness that are pleasing unto God. So, we are obtaining the outcome of our faith. The salvation of our souls. Now, this is not being redundant. He's not talking about our being born again. I hope we're clear on that by now. He's talking about future salvation. I'm like a virgin saving myself for the bridegroom. I'm saving my best for him. I do not spend my best on my own passions. I'm spending my life on him for the future reign in heaven. Ours is the greatest salvation. And that's the reason, if you look back to Let's, let's go back now. I think we can go back to uh, Hebrews 2 and look at verse 3. Where he asked this question, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? It is not a common salvation. 
It is such a great salvation. And not just a great salvation. It is such a great salvation. Notice the, the adjective. Such a great salvation. And then uh, Hebrews 7, 25. We'll get to it in a number of weeks. But listen to these words in Hebrews 7, 25. Jesus is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. So we are saved to the uttermost. It is a great salvation. Now that brings us to another, to another great thing. What is the greatest danger that you and I face? So we know about our greatest salvation. It's the greatest thing we have. So what is our greatest danger? Our greatest danger is not in being lost again. Our greatest danger is not going to hell. That's been taken care of. Our greatest danger is to drift from this. Our greatest danger is to neglect such a great salvation. With this in mind, what a tragedy it would be, and it is for multitudes who are neglecting this great salvation, which cannot be overestimated or over. Stated because there is this looming judgment that is hanging over us. It's this ominous judgment. And in 2 Corinthians 5 10, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ to give an account of these, not in the flesh, only the evil. Now, let me remind you that the entire book of Revelation is not about the Lamb of God, it's about the Lion of Judah. Jesus is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. He died as a lamb. He was led to the slaughter like a lamb. But he is nothing like a lamb now. He is king, waiting to receive his kingdom. And when he does, he's going to judge his people. And all through the book of Revelation, we see he's the lamb of the tribe of Judah. The world doesn't understand that. It doesn't mean anything. But it means something to us because we know what it means to be a lion. He roars like my name says, the lion has roared. And that's Jesus Christ and his roaring judgment, this ominous judgment that's looming over us. Listen to Hebrews 2 and 3. Let's read it together. How shall we escape? How shall we, God's people, those of us who are born again, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? It was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to by us, and this is by the apostles, by us, uh, by those who heard. While God also bore witness with signs and wonders and various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit, distributing accordingly to his will. Listen to these things. This is how God how much God has invested in us. He has declared these things to us. The Lord has declared them to us. The Lord has spoken them to us. They've been verified by the apostles, those who heard. And they've been proven by signs and wonders and miracles and gifts. What else could God have done? That's what he said in Isaiah chapter 1. Remember when he said, the ox doesn't know its owner and the crib doesn't know its master's? Uh, Saul, and he said, what else could I have done for my people? And he looks at us today and says, what else could I have done? I've provided you with a Savior, and I've given you this, these promises. I've told you about the inheritance. What else could I have done? Now, let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, or chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and let's spend a few moments here, because the children of Israel are unique. And Paul brings them up in chapter 10 of 1 Corinthians. And remember that the Corinthian church was an unruly church. Much like the church today. And so in chapter 10, Paul introduces to us the example of our forefathers. He said, I want us to stop for a moment and think about our forefathers. Verse 1 of chapter 10, 1 Corinthians. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers. That our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the
the sea. That's the Red Sea. And all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And all ate the same spiritual food. And all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them. And the rock was Christ. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now, these things took place as examples for us that we might not desire evil as they did. Think about this. This is how God dealt with his rebellious and disobedient children. Paul is very clear about this. Israel is God's nation. And Israel and the church literally are one and the same. All of us are God's children. They were saved looking forward to Christ. We are saved looking back on Christ. Christ is the center of God's people. And this is what God did to his people who were not really notice this. They all suffered. Now, they all drank from the same drink. They all ate the same food. That was the manna from heaven. They all crossed the Red Sea. All of them were under the cloud. Notice, notice that all of them were a part of it. That's us today. But all of Israel suffered. And so all of the church is suffering today because of the sins of some. And he says here, God was not pleased with some of them. We don't know how many. But it wasn't all of them that were sinning. But uh, uh, God puts all of us together. And this is the reason we need to pray for revival. If your heart is right with God and you're not a part of the problem, you need to be praying for revival. It's our brothers and sisters that are dragging us down. It's our brothers and sisters that are causing all this trouble on us. It's those unruly and disobedient ones. Those, those, those who just don't not live for him anymore. They don't read their Bibles anymore. They don't pray. They don't feed on him. They don't look to him. They're busy with other things. These are the people that are pulling the church down. And God, this is how God deals with his people. I don't know how anything could be clearer. Look at verse 6 in 1 Corinthians 10. Now these things took place as examples for us. That we might not desire evil as they did. Do not be idolaters as some of them were. As it is written. The people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. And that's where I wanted to be just a little bit ago. I want us to think about this for a moment. You remember when Moses went up on the mountain to receive the tablets and, and, and he and Aaron were coming down and Aaron said, there's noise in the camp. Sound like a big party. I mean, it sound, sounded like war. And Moses said, no, it sounded like a party. And when they got there, were they ever having a big party? And what had happened? Well, let's listen to this. Just listen to it. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered themselves together to Aaron, and they said to him, as a matter of fact, it was Moses and Joshua, not Moses and Aaron. Okay. So they, they, they came to Aaron, and they said, Up, make us gods who shall go before us. Can you think of a more idiotic statement? Make us gods that will go before us? Who did, who, did they not remember who parted the Red Sea for them? Do they not remember who fed them with manna every morning? Do they not remember him who sent quail to them? Do they not remember the one that brought water out of a rock? I mean, what is it with these people? Can you imagine this? But Paul said these are examples for us so that we won't act like they did. And alas, we seem to be doing the same thing. They said, up, make for us gods. Who shall go before us? As for this Moses, the man who brought us up, oh, there he is, the man who brought us up out of the land to Egypt. We don't know what happened to him. We don't know what's become of him. So Aaron said to him, take off the rings of gold that are in your ears and the ears of your wives and sons and your daughters and bring them to me. Wait a minute. Where did they get the gold? These are slaves that came out of Egypt, right? 
They're, they've been slaves for 435 years. Where did they get gold earrings and gold jewelry and these exquisite things? Where did they come from? God changed, before they left Egypt, God changed the hearts of, of the Egyptians. And these people were told to go and ask for gold and silver from the Egyptians who were rich. They did, and the Egyptians gave it to them. And the Bible says, and so they plundered the Egyptians. Only God could do that. And so they take these things that God has given them, and they gave them to Aaron, and Aaron, although he denied it later on, he said, I threw the gold into the fire, and this is what came out. But the, the, the Bible is very clear. Listen, listen to what the scripture says. So Aaron said to them, take off the rings of gold that are in the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. And so all the people took off the rings of gold that were in their ears and brought them to Aaron, and he received the gold from their hands and fashioned it with a graving tool and made a golden calf. He denied that he had done it. It's like a miracle. I just threw it in there, and out came this calf. And they said, the people said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. So it is. This is the way God deals with his unruly, disobedient, rebellious people. And we see that happening right before our eyes today. We're dealing with this plague called COVID. And it's not soon to go away. It won't be long before we'll be going to places of business and we'll be denied entrance if we're not wearing a mask. And the best studies we have declare that it just doesn't help. Maybe it help a little bit. Who knows? But but to force people, anybody's free to do whatever they want to. If they want to wear one, fine. If they don't, I'd never, I'd never criticize anybody for it. Sometimes people have very legitimate reasons for it. But we have to understand that this is what God has put on us. That's the reason we're in this colossal mess. Now let's go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and finish up that chapter and we'll be through. All right? 1 Corinthians 10 and, and verse 8. We must not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did. These are God's people. And 23,000 fell in a single day. That's Numbers chapter 25. We must not put Christ to the test as some of them did and were destroyed by the serpent. That's Numbers 21. Verse 10. Nor grumble as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. Numbers chapter 16, verse 49. Now verse 11. Now, these things happened to them as an example. But they were written down for our instruction, on whom the end of the ages has come. Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed, lest he fall. Could we remember, Peter, when the Lord said someone's going to betray me? And Peter said, Lord, I'll go with you to death. Even, I'll go with you even to death. And the Lord said, Peter, before the crow, cock crows tonight, you will divide night with three times. Let him who thinks he stands. So many people think they stand. The church is filled with people today who think <coughs> they stand. But they're not standing on the solid rock standing on Jesus Christ. So let's remember once again the answer to the question. How shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? We won't. We will not escape. We have not escaped and we won't escape. We're under the judgment of God. 2 Corinthians 5, 9 and 10. We make it our aim to please Jesus. Because we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Therefore, knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade others. How should we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? This salvation is the greatest thing that can possibly 
we can never imagine this. All we can do is read it, hear it, and believe it, and rejoice in it. And how can we neglect that? Hell is not our home. Heaven is our home. God has been gracious and kind and merciful to us. And we're so much better off than the saints of the Old Testament. What's the difference between the saints of the Old Testament and the saints of the New Testament? The indwelling of the Holy Spirit. The saints of the Old Testament had to obey the law all on their own. They had no strength given to them. At various and sundry times, the Holy Spirit came upon some of them for special acts. But the average believer in the Old Testament was left to himself to be obedient to the commands of Christ. And they all failed. And that's the problem that Paul had in 2 Corinthians, uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. I think we looked at that just a couple of weeks ago on Sunday morning. Where Paul said, you know, the things I don't want to do, I keep on doing. The things I want to do, I, I don't, don't find myself doing it. He said, I just can't get to the program. He said, wretched man that I am, who will live me from this body of death? And then in Romans 8, 1, he said, I thank God through Jesus Christ. Because there is therefore now no condemnation. And we, the Jews in the Old Testament were condemned to failure. We are not condemned to failure. We can fulfill the law. Jesus didn't come to destroy the law. He came to fulfill the law. And this is so important. I want you to hang on to this and remember. We don't keep the letter of the law. The Jews tried that. We don't keep the letter of the law. That's the reason we don't worship on the Sabbath. The Sabbath is from 6 o'clock on Friday to 6 o'clock on Saturday. Always has been. I grew up hearing, hearing good men pray in church all my life growing up in church. Thank you, Lord, for this another Sabbath day. Wrong. You just thank you for Saturday. Started on Friday night, ended on Saturday night. It was over. Monday's first day of the week. So we don't keep the letter of the law. We keep the spirit of the law. We fulfill the purpose of the law. The meaning of the law. That's critically important. I hope you can keep that in mind. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for uh, our time together tonight. We thank you for these uh, wonderful words, for these passages of Scripture that we've woven together. And we pray, Father, that they've helped us. Uh, this is what Bible study is designed to do, to, to, to give us a reason for the hope that is in us, to, to build up our most holy faith. And so I pray that uh, we've experienced that tonight. I pray that we leave better than when we came. Because we have sat at your table tonight and we've had a very wholesome and pleasing and delightful meal together. We have fed on your word and we're better for it. And we thank you in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen.